My name is Michael Suarez. I'm the director of Rivermore School, but it's my great privilege to welcome you uh, to this summer lecture in our summer lecture series. Our speaker tonight, Craig Welsh, is Associate Professor of Communications and Humanities at Penn State Harrisburg. After earning a BS in architecture from Penn State University, he earned an MA in advertising design from Syracuse University and an MFA in graphic design from Marywood University. Beyond the classroom, Welsh is the principal of a highly successful design studio based in Lancaster, PA. Additionally, he is the founder of Society of Design, a nonprofit organization dedicated to multidisciplinary design education and community service. His letterpress and design work has received international recognition and has been exhibited in some 15 countries. No wonder, then, that he has been a featured speaker at such institutions as Cooper Hewitt, the Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City, and the Hamilton Woodtype and Printing Museum in Wisconsin. This evening, he will address us on the typesetting and designs of the Declaration of Independence Broadsides. Please join me in welcoming you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction. I will promise Clarence that I'm not going to roam too much. I tend to roam when I speak. Um, I need to make sure I thank some other people that were so kind to get me here this evening. Uh, Beppe uh, Landrum Owens is someone that I met virtually in a basically a conference presentation. So online, I've never met her in person, but she's been exceptional to just trade emails and. We actually write handwritten notes and letters and send things in the old school mail system, which has been fantastic. Um, Philip, who has helped to coordinate things, I don't believe he's here this evening. Um, Kim and Adam for helping get everything kind of coordinated uh, for the trip. And then Joseph Berry, who um, was kind enough to meet with me earlier today and helped me get officially into the registration system, I'm not sure what to call it, to be able to look at things in the special collections, which was so nice. So thank you for um, inviting me, and it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I love Virginia, UVA, Rare Book School. I was here before, and I met with some people in special collections, but for as much as I love this Virginia, you're number two. This is number one. This is my mom, Virginia Lee Welsh. <laughs> And so I sent her this photo earlier. I said, this is the first slide for my presentation. She got back, she said, oh my God, why? <laughs> so it's my mom's high school um, senior photo. I'm not here to talk about my mom. I'm here to talk about typesetting and designs. Although my mom is, so my mom is a retired sign painter. And so I grew up watching her letter and do all this stuff. And then I had typography classes in college. And I went home and I, I remember telling her, I'm like, do you know there's like names for all these things? Like where you take the tape off? And she's like, no, I just know how to do it. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Uh, typesetting and designs of the Declaration of Independence broadsides. So I'm gonna touch on a number of things related to the broadsides and then some other aspects of the declaration. So Dunlap in 1776, the first official version of the declaration that was printed July 4. Also gonna mention Matlack, and it's great because you can go right around the corner here and see like a lot of this stuff, which is fantastic. Um, so Timothy Matlack in mid-July 76 did the engrossed hand-lettered version that everybody kind of knows from history books and the big John Hancock signature and um, the films and 
mentioning Catherine Go- Mary Catherine Goddard from Baltimore in January 77. Can I mention Tyler? And I saw that you have one of these uh, around the corner. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what's happening by the early 19th century. Also going to see right on kind of the heels of what Tyler was doing, we see William Stone doing a facsimile copy of the Matlack. Also going to go all the way back to the beginning. This is Jefferson, his hand lettered. And so I, I come from this primarily, um, I, so I have this like two-pronged approach to the way that I go at things that I research. Part of my, my thought process is rooted in the industry and the practitioner part of the equation. So design studio and how type works and design and layout and composition and those things. And then part of it in my teaching capacity is research and looking through archive materials and trying to find source materials. So um, ultimately, we're going to mention the copper plate, which was brought back to life in 1976 as part of the bicentennial celebration. So I have a print shop in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, a number of cylinder presses. Vander Cook's on the left. I have platen presses on the right. The one that's right here is from 1886. The oldest type I have is some wood type from the mid-19th century. So I started getting into this. This was totally by chance. I saw a listing on a website called Briar Press for somebody who was selling their whole shop. It wasn't this. It, the whole shop that I bought, I think this is the only thing left from that. The rest I got out of my mind and started getting very <laughs> consumed by letterpress. I have hundreds of cases of metal and wood type. It's kind of everywhere. Um, you're all welcome if you're ever in Lancaster. Give me a shout. You can come in. We can print, get inky. Um, I have 300 or so new old stock, never been opened packs of metal type, which looks like this when you actually open it. This is a font called Venus. I think this is 14 point Venus. We have a project that we're thinking about using this. So we at least had to like open the package just to see what we had to work with. Um, so I have, I have a bit of knowledge about how this all works in terms of the, the practical application of putting ink to paper. So this is, um, the quarter's in there for scale. This is six point metal type. This is copper plate. I don't know the exact version of copper plate. Um, but really, really small stuff. And what I had been trying to do is, for Society of Design, Michael mentioned I started this nonprofit, and when we were inviting people, we decided that we would make the invitations kind of impossible to say no to our invite. Um, and so we went to these great lengths to make these things happen. You can see this has been driving me nuts. That H right there is turned 90 degrees. <laughs> That's what you... so. That's what you find in the proof. I'm like, oh, that looked straight before. I mean, this is like reader glasses and magnifying and everything to get, and tweezers. Um, it looks like this when it's printed. This is um, metallic silver ink in 100% cotton. This is Letra paper. For those of you who are letterpress people, you'd know that sheet of stock. Um, so I, I'm mentioning this because I have this practical sense of what it is to set type and to put ink to paper and kind of all those variables that come into play. But my declaration story kind of starts at Renninger's Antique Market in Adamstown, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. So in the 1980s, there's this story, and I sent an intern from my design studio here to check this story out. And then he came back, he was all like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, do you have any idea what, and he's, I'm like, what, calm down, what is happening with you? He's like, I went there, and they told me about this guy who claims that he bought a painting for four bucks because he wanted the frame, and when he got home, he was taking the painting out of the frame, and he found the declaration. But these people don't believe him because nobody remembers selling anybody a painting for four bucks, and they've all been at their stands for like forever. And I'm like, okay. So he's like, no, but here's the thing. The conspiracy is it's an attorney from Philadelphia who was representing an elderly client, and the elderly, elderly client, he was scamming this person by taking the copy of the declaration, but he didn't know how to get it out of her or his holding, so he came up with this story because nobody could really say it wasn't true, so there's this whole conspiracy thing that exists in this flea market. Um, so that was part of how I was like, okay, calm down, 
But this story gets even weirder. <laughs> in my studio, we do a lot of these projects that somehow they end up going these weird directions, but weird, uh, hopefully in a good, good way. So this was the next layer and the same interns with me and we visit, of all places, a warehouse in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in the city, this massive warehouse with 70 cannons. The former mayor of Lancaster City collects cannons. He's since passed, but I got in touch with him and I said, hey, do you happen to have a Revolutionary War cannon? He said, no, I have a barrel. And I'm like, that's the part I need. I didn't realize when I said cannon, it meant like all the things. I just need the part that shoots stuff. He's like, yes, I have one. So I took the intern and what I was doing is on the left, this is the Revolutionary War cannon barrel, which was under, it was like the bottom of this warehouse rack system. So thankfully it was on the ground, but in some ways it was a little awkward because I had to slide in on my side with a headlamp on using this funnel and then this piece of metal to scrape the inside of the cannon barrel to get pieces of metal fragments out of the cannon barrel. My hope was I could get enough of the metal fragments out of the cannon barrel that I could then grind it into a dust, mix it with the ink so that every version of the facsimile prints that I pulled would have literal pieces of the Revolutionary War in the prints. <laughs> when you go to CVS and ask for mortar and pestle, this is 2014, which I'm guessing Breaking Bad and the meth kind of thing was pretty popular at the time because I started getting lots of questions that I kept thinking, I can answer this honestly, but that's gonna make me absolutely sound like I'm not doing something the way I should be doing. Because when I tell them I'm gonna scrape the inside of a Revolutionary War cannon barrel, get the metal, grind it up, mix it in, make copies of the declaration, they would absolutely never sell it. So I had to buy the mortar and pestle online. And they wouldn't sell it to me. I just, I think I walked out of the store. So in 2014, I decided I would spend the night of July 4th into July 5th to try to replicate what Dunlap was doing as he was printing the first version of the Declaration. So another layer of this, as I get more and more into this, this is from Hancock, as there is not a more distinguished event in the history of America than the Declaration of Our Independence, nor any that in all probability will so much excite the attention of future ages, it is highly proper that the memory of that transaction together with the causes that gave rise to it should be preserved in the most careful manner that can be devised, which leads us to the Continental Restaurant on Second and Market in Philadelphia. And why are we at the Continental? Because this door on the right is the Continental Kitchen Door. This door is the door to the headquarters of the Star Restaurant Group, which runs the Continental, this sign in the middle during the bicentennial in July, this journalism plaque was attached to this building that this is the site where John Dunlap printed the Declaration of Independence. He also printed the first newspaper printing of the US Constitution, Washington's farewell address. The first daily newspaper becomes popular through Dunlap's efforts. And the great thing is that if you're at this place, if, if you're close to that and somebody blasts their way out of the kitchen, you're gonna get whacked by that door. <laughs> this does not match what Hancock had in mind, in my view. <laughs> he was not expecting that you're gonna get banged in the side by this kitchen door when reading this sign. So again, interns with me and American Philosophical Society also has an incredible collection of artifacts that date back to the colonial period. One of the things that was on display was a handwritten draft of the Declaration by Jefferson. And I had the same, in, this one intern is just like a thread through this thing. He now works at Apple, so like he's really <laughs> smart um, and a really gifted designer. Uh, I was fascinated because I love seeing Jefferson like adding serifs to these letter form, like why would you take the time to do that? Like, it's just so bizarre. Like, I, I don't even, like I write uppercase letters a lot. I never remember adding serifs. Um, so I said to the intern, I'm like, I don't think you're supposed to take photos in the exhibit space. And he's like, oh, you're not. But 
I had to because you would never believe me that they actually have these things there. So he was kind of right, because then I was like, let's go see it. Um, so we went back to APS and looked at these draft copies they had on display. So now to the Dunlap. Um, the first official version as commissioned by Congress in July 1776. There's a second version. And so I'm at the early stages still of this, this more focused kind of research on the type and the design of the declaration, specifically the broadsides. And I'm, I'm focusing in on the broadsides because it's something that I feel I have some familiarity with in terms of setting the type and putting ink on paper. Um, I'm not sure of the exact date that this is approximated to, but there is only one copy of this version. There are 26 copies of this known. So the differences between these two, so the 26 on the left, one on the right that are known to exist. APS in Philadelphia has the one on the right. The first thing that I noticed is the difference with the rule. So anytime, in design terms, a rule is a line. So the rule to me was the most obvious difference between the two. Um, this is paper that's vellum. So in terms of the, the stock that it's printed on, different there as well. But what I also started to notice, and I've been really trying to make some sense of the type of these, the typography of these printings. The uppercase L, this, if I go back one slide, the type on the right feels slightly thinner overall than the type on the left in terms of the stroke thickness and the weight, the visual weight of the type on the right. And so when I look at the uppercase L in this case is the most, it's the, it's the tell um, that I'm seeing the bottom horizontal portion extends farther than on the left and the serif, the little extension off that primary stroke is quite a bit different. So this requires more effort to try to make some sense of that. In 1976 for the Bicentennial, Frederick Goff wrote a book focused on the then 21 copies of the Dunlap broadside that were known to exist. So in his book, he starts pointing out a number of things that I'm not sure that prior to his examination, so he, he somehow was able to get all 21 extant copies to Washington, D.C., photographed all of them, and documented all of the very specific things about each of the 21 copies. Um, what he started to put, excuse me, point out is, in this case, the P in Philadelphia falls to the left side of the N right above it. In this case, it shifted at some point. So some of the copies have the, the attribution line at the bottom. The Philadelphia either hits below the left side of the N or below the comma. And so this is one of the mysteries of trying to make sense of what happened, why did that line shift. Um, there are different theories about this. Uh, Beppe had some really interesting theories about why this may have taken place. But that's one of the things that I, I feel deserves some <coughs> further examination because it's, it's kind of just been left out there as an unknown. And it may never be solved. One of the things that Goff also figures out is that in Dunlap's printing, there are exactly 76 lines of type, if you count from top to bottom, which I, I, I can't imagine that's by chance. Um, I feel it's less by chance that Hugh Gain in New York, he also has 76 lines in the copy of the declaration that he printed. And this follows Dunlap's like formatting and composition pretty closely. And then the only other one that has 76 lines is, and this feels like somebody's name, Timothy Charleston. It's Peter Timothy from Charleston. It, it would have been easier if I actually spelled it Charlestown, which is how it was known at the time. But Timothy Charleston is not a person. It's Peter Timothy from Charleston, South Carolina. His also has 76 lines. None of the others fit that 76 line rhythm in terms of how the typesetting has occurred. What happens with Timothy's though, is this switch to the type in this line in general Congress assembled, which for some reason it shifts. Most of these appear to have been printed in Caslon type or some variation of Caslon that was either brought in from England or it was cast in the States. So it looks like Caslon, but might not quite be there. So I've been using the term as I've been taking notes on things over the past 
years and months, it's Kaslan-esque, um, seems to be the, the effect of these things, but this is clearly not Kaslan. Um, and so there's no way we'll ever know for sure. I know from my experience in my shop, this may be as simple as there was no more physical type available in the case. There, there just, there wasn't. Like I've run into that. Like I've had things where, thankfully with the internet, there are things where you can copy and paste all your text that you're gonna typeset and it'll count how many of each letter. And you know that E is the most common letter used in English language. So I usually plug in all the copy and then see how many E's and then I'll go to the case of the type I'm thinking of using and I'll count how many E's I have just to make sure I don't have to like, that's where the, the phrase out of sorts comes from. Uh, everybody know that? I feel like I'm talking to people who already know all this stuff. So a single piece of metal type is a sort. So if you're out of sorts, that phrase of like you're losing control is because if you don't have any more sorts, you're in a real bad spot. So it may be that Timothy was, he just didn't have any other Caslon left to set that line of type. <coughs> so Goff makes this comment in his book, priority was established through the evidence furnished by damaged letters. Study of all the copies revealed that during the course of the printing, certain other letters became damaged. I do not agree with this. I don't see how these pieces of metal could be damaged by the printing process. I don't believe that could happen. And he gets very specific of which, which individual letters he's talking about having been damaged. So he's claiming that the H in the, this had to be a later print because that H got damaged, and that's his word, damaged through the printing process. Now, there were only about 200 copies estimated to have been printed. There's no way this got damaged in the printing process. My sense is this is maybe he didn't have experience, Goff didn't have experience as a printer putting ink on paper. That if I, if I saw this at my shop, my first thing would be, Maybe I just need to focus on getting better ink coverage on that. Run another proof and see if that helped at all. Sometimes it's just the first pass of ink just doesn't quite make it. The other thing to keep in mind is when these are being printed, these aren't, so in the printing process, there are typically sheets called make readies, where you're, you're making the press ready for production. So you're just making sure everything's positioned the right way. Most of it tends to be that you're getting enough ink coverage. So you're checking the ink levels that everything's getting inked the right way. In this case, even if you had a make ready, you're not discarding it. These are too precious and time is too urgent that you're gonna keep whatever. And it's not like somebody gets this word and it's like, I don't know what that is. Like, you know what it says, right? You're not like calling up Dunlap and saying like, hey, that the is terrible. Um, so I would try re-inking it. The next thing I would do is I would go to my case to see if I happen to have another lowercase h in that font at that size. That I would then pull that out, this is probably tweezering, pull that out, put the next one in, ink it again, pull a new proof, see if by just replacing that h if I've solved the problem, that there may have been something in the casting or maybe that did get damaged prior to putting it on press. I would check that. If that doesn't work, the next thing I'm doing, and I, I didn't believe when I was first learning this that this would actually work, and I thought the guy was nuts until I saw him do it, and then I do it all the time. If you pull that one single piece of type out, if you can very carefully get a single thin sheet of paper down to where that's gonna sit again, just that tiny little bit of paper underneath tends to get most of these things, especially with the smaller point size, to raise up to type high, which is 0.918 inches, and it will ink fine. Like I have so many things like when I lock up jobs and I pull them apart that there's all these little pieces of paper underneath where I've just kind of like helped to make these tiny little pieces sit at the right height. Here's another one, the bottom of the F. Again, I would swap this out with another F. I would try some other things. I don't think this is an indication that this is later in the printing process. I actually think these are probably earlier, that these would be corrected more than they would be happening later in the process. Also keeping in mind, this is the process of inking in that period. These, um, 
blotting or these beading of the inks, these ink balls. Um, so it's leather with the ink kind of seeping through the leather. And it's not like in today's world where there's rollers that evenly coat and go nice and smooth across the surface of the type. So there would be so many variables in that period of time in, in how these were being printed. All right, so another thing that came, I don't know what this date is, 2012. So I had seen, this is one of the things that started getting me paying attention to um, what was happening with the declaration. So Nick Sherman writes this article, and Nick is a really well-respected type designer. Um, he used to work for, I think, Monotype, and has designed a number of fonts. Um, he's also somebody at Hamilton Wood Type and Printing Museum in Wisconsin who has designed some new wood type that was cut by the museum. Um, so, and I've talked to Nick, not about this specifically, but about some other things, and I, he's very well respected. So he wrote this article trying to figure out which version of Caslon was used to print the declaration. And one of the things he gets into is this overlaying in Photoshop of having scanned different parts of the declaration and then superimposing letter upon letter in different colors to see where the, the variation may be. And so he's kind of seeing a variation in the uppercase E. This specimen sheet from 1734 for Caslon type is a reference point that a lot of people use. Nick used this, plus he said he was studying a lot of the um, specimen books at Columbia University in New York at the time. And so if we look at these body copy sections of um, type in the center here, this is Dunlap on the left and the specimen sheet for Caslon on the right. It feels like a pretty good match. So it, I mean, it to me is like, well, that's like really, really close. But then I started inspecting more closely and I get to the uppercase R's. And this is where I started to have a lot of questions about, okay, the type, if we're really gonna try to identify Caslon and which version of Caslon, I'm looking at an R and I'm looking at it as the tell because it has three things that are pretty unique. It has a vertical stem, a straight, it has a round bowl, and it has a diagonal leg. So all those moves are kind of, the, the majority of what we're gonna see in any letter form is a straight, a round, or a curve and a diagonal. And then we have these serifs on the end. The serifs are the little extensions, even this thing at the top, off the primary strokes. And when I look at these, none of these seem the same. And these are all from Dunlap's declaration. So all of a sudden, I'm like, this isn't one cut of Caslon. This is multiple, and they may not even all be Caslon. They may be something that somebody local to Philadelphia or somewhere else in the colonies at the time had cast metal type and happened to be in Dunlap's shop, and he was using what was available at the time, and he was pulling things, as I think all letterpress printers who set metal type do, you adjust as you're going because you don't, it's not like on the computer now where we're used to just like, I key it in and I change the font size, I flip it, I turn it, I change the color, I do whatever I want. Like, it, it's very limited in how you work with type. So with that, I started looking into more about Caslon, so, um, Lieberman has this quote about Caslon, one of the most controversial typefaces in history. Some consider it the greatest type ever. Others think it overrated. A collection of mistakes, elusively out of keeping with everything. Caslon is a prime example of a face in which the individual letters are nothing, but the total effect is strong and honest. <laughs> so he's the first president of the American Printing History Association. And I was like, okay, so let me see. And at my studio, we have tons of books so I love being around here and like that all of you are book minded because like my young students now, they're like, books. I'm like, come on, there's so much stuff in those that the world doesn't know about anymore. So the one on the left is from 1906, American Type Founders, Linotype from the 1930s, and then this is my college type book um, from 1970s. The book's older than I am, so I was not in college in the 1970s. In the Linotype book, they make this claim Linotype Caslon Old Face is authentic in every detail. Every one of these books that I looked at, these specimen books, this is the same, this is claimed to be the same font. These legs on the R's, they're not the same. And this is on the same page. Like, if we look at the serif, the little extension, they're totally different. But this is, 
in the linotype specimen book, this is the same font. And I'm like, that's not even close. That's not the same at all. Like, it, to a designer, that's not even close to the same. So I think Kazlinesque is becoming maybe more of the correct description of what was happening with the typesetting in the period. This one gets pretty interesting. So German language broadside printed in Philadelphia, and this is within a few days of Dunlap setting. Makes sense because they were local to um, Philadelphia. There are only two known copies of this. One is in, I think, England, somewhere in Europe, and then the other one is in, at Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania. So not too far from where I am, and um, it's fascinating to see that even in the first few days of the declaration printing that we have this German version of it. Russell and or Rogers in Salem, four column here, which is pretty interesting approach. Um, one of the things that we see with this though, and this is part of what I'm looking at, is just all these little nuanced things is, this is not centered. And you would think that, like on a computer, you just select that, command shift C, and everything just snaps right to, to where it need, need to be. But on the printing press at the time, there may not have been the right amount of spacing material to get those to be centered. Or it was just an oversight and nobody caught it. This one, I love the, the whole look of this. It has this added statement at the top from the New York legislature explaining that they've kind of agreed to the terms of the declaration. This is printed by Holt in New York, John Holt. Um, it has all this ornamenting around the edges, which the ornamenting is great. And there's ornamenting on the 1734 Caslon specimen sheet too. So it makes sense. We see ornamenting show up in a number of places in the colonial printing period. Um, another place that shows up quite a bit is colonial currency. This is the thing that I love about it. And I actually like, like this is called kerning, the spacing between two glyphs or two letter forms. Um, this is terrible. Like this is just like, this is, there's no way around it. This is just terrible kerning. Um, it's just, it's fantastic in its awkwardness um, because it's so authentic and it's like, it, I feel like there's all these things being revealed about how rushed this must have been or how nervous this must have felt to be printing and risking your life by putting it, and they, they put their names on these things. It's like, do you think through that? Like, I know self-promo <laughs> helps you get work, but like, really? Um, this is kind of an interesting comparison where the broadside is on the left and the newspaper version is on the right. And what we're seeing on the right is we're losing some of the ornamenting, probably, again, a physical limitation of the space available, that we couldn't have three, like a three thick ornamenting. So it goes to a single thickness, but a lot of the rest of it is similar Although somebody caught the IC kerning, and it got a little better. <laughs> not, quite, not quite right, but I'm, again, thinking that maybe they just didn't have the right spacing material to get that to set correctly. This one I love. <laughs> Back up. Like, what? Whoops. Um, Thompson is also misspelled. Thompson doesn't have a P. So Charles Thompson does not have a P. So this is like bad twice. But this got fixed. I should have had it larger. So Hancock and Thompson are both fixed on the this, round two. <laughs> That's why you proof. But this one actually made it out into the world for a brief period of time. Uh, all right. So Matlack, 1776. Pretty faded. Goddard. Mary Catherine Goddard in Baltimore, she's working from the actual Matlack version. Congress makes its way to Baltimore without getting into the reasons why. So Congress is in Baltimore, they have her print. This is the first time the word 13 shows up on a broadside. It was then clarified earlier, it, it didn't quite have some of the details. The other thing that is unique to hers is she's the first one, this is the first version that the world began to know who signed the declaration. There was only one, the Matlack, that had the signatures until Goddard prints her version. And so I like some of this stuff on the left. You can see her kind of piecing together, like here, piecing together the rule material. And there's these spaces. So she's kind of fitting this stuff together to make these, print, or these brackets. This is telling that um, Thomas McKean from Delaware is not included. 
So the thinking is he hadn't signed the Matlack and Gross copy yet. So with the joy of Photoshop, I added him <laughs> um, to see what it might look like. I should have taken the next step, which I'm guessing the way this gets locked up on a press, that would sit too high. So my guess is this would all push down. New Hampshire would go to the top of this column, and all of this would go down, and that would all fit. So I think New Hampshire, I should have done that. It should all move up there, <laughs> and that pushes down. So on the computer, you can do that in like 10 seconds. Um, on the press, that's a whole other thing. Just like the Continental, this was a CVS um, pharmacy. It's now going to condos. This is Baltimore. The circled area is Mary Catherine's <laughs> original print shop. Also, given its due <laughs> in history's view of what happened on that site. Uh, Tyler, one's around the corner. I like this one because once we get out of, so we're in the early 19th century and America's kind of coming out of the War of 1812 and looking toward the 50th anniversary and there's this renewed interest in what was happening in the founding of the country. Engraved copies are starting to happen so the type gets a lot more expressive. Like you, you would not find cast type with this kind of detail at the, at the time. Um, so I like, typographically, I like just seeing these as references for what was happening around that time. Um, 1823, William Stone does a facsimile copy, and then there's a second facsimile in 1833. And if you ask my wife, I lost my mind because I bought a second facsimile copy at auction, which is at my office, and she still says, like, why do you need that? I'm like, I don't need it. That's not a need. That's a thing that... I'm like, but now, see, by you inviting me here, it justifies a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is seeing, so what was happening is, and there are theories about why the one on the left, the original, has degraded so much, um, and Stone may be to blame for some of that, maybe all of it, but this is if they're Photoshopped together just to see kind of how accurate Stone's engraving had been. This copper plate, 1976, so if we see this, this is the copper plate, it still exists. And in 1976, Philadelphia for the Bicentennial, the commission that was working on the Bicentennial, requested from the National Archives to have the original Matlack and Gross copy on display in Philadelphia for the Bicentennial celebration. And that got shut down pretty quickly. So what they did is they pulled the original copper plate that was cut by stone, um, and they, they printed like nine copies of it, somewhere like eight to 10 copies in 1976 and provided those new, so it would technically be, I guess, the third facsimile of this printing in 1976 was provided, those copies were provided to Philadelphia. So this is kind of the, the trajectory of how this timeline worked. It was pretty fast, basically 12 days aside from the ones that go south. So Timothy in Charlestown, um, his is in early August, so not too much later. And then Mary Catherine Goddard, January of 77, is the last one that kind of makes its way into the world as these broadside prints. And so just to kind of look at some of these, there are several more, depending on... So this is... It's been kind of interesting. So places like... UVA, other colleges, universities, libraries, auction houses. There's a, a mix of stuff and sources of how things have been recorded about all of these. And so one of the things I'm working on is trying to take all of these different pieces of the puzzle and try to figure out where are the common things that are known about these and then challenge what is being claimed in other places but I like seeing like the one column versions, and then we go to two column, we have the four column, we have the Mary Catherine Goddard two column over four column. So just in terms of design and composition, I think printers are actually the original designers, um, but they're not really seen as that in contemporary time. I, I think that they're, they're being shorted their due in terms of how much they were designing at the time. 
So if you know of things or if you want more than what we discussed tonight or anything, please get in touch with me. Even if it's some weird thing like there's a cannon barrel that needs scraped, <laughs> I'm down for that. Um, anything that you might know that you think would be of interest or benefit to what I'm trying to find and source would be greatly appreciated. And thank you very much for coming out tonight. It's, it's great to just have this kind of come to life and my sabbatical leave, thankfully I have the next year to just kind of like be focused on this and really push this forward. So I'm sure I will be seeing some of you again because I'm planning I'm gonna be back here probably a few times at least. Thank you again. Questions? Yes, sir. Craig, first of all, thank you for this. Yeah. yeah. Is it great that you could speak to some of these individual printers? Were there pre existing designs that informed what they did? It's like, ah, a decoration. I imagine that. That's two columns. Or was there some pre existing idea that would inform either the type of the, the choice of type or just the overall use on quality of these So I think that there's two things. I think the type choice was probably limited at the time, just given the, the sources from which you could actually get type or cast type. So I think Caslon was probably just the, at the time, it's probably like Helvetica or Arial are today, given that we have so much screen-based media that the sans serif font style is probably what we would say is period correct for now. Um, so Caslon is probably the, the default in a lot of ways that some of the sans serif fonts are today. Um, in terms of formatting, I think most of what was happening was either books being produced by these printers, and Joseph might have some knowledge of this too, but I think books were probably the, the more frequently printed print pieces. Um, newspapers started to come into the mix in the colonial period. Dunlap certainly does this. Mary Catherine Goddard certainly, like a lot of them get into newspaper. When you get to columns, Columns allow you, I would say, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of probably 15 to 20% more type can be set if you get to columns. Because you don't have these, like the, the wider the column, the more potential like negative or dead space you have where a line ends and then you have like nothing past that. You need to start the next line. So I think newspapers at, in the period are probably the first thing that they're, they're seeing, like columns becoming a useful design element in terms of comp composition and formatting. Um, in terms of the declaration, so I find it interesting, like Gain and Timothy are the two that most resemble the layout and composition of Dunlaps. I'm not so sure that all these printers got a copy of the Dunlap. And I think that's the, that's the Contention that's being made in a lot of what I'm finding right now is that, oh, this person, this printer decided to change what Dunlap had because there's a lot of, I was mentioning this earlier today about commas and periods. That's a comma, that's a period. And so, ooh, that may not have just, that may not have inked properly. That period may have been a comma. It just didn't get all the ink. You know, that's a tiny little thing. So I'm not convinced that the Dunlap was like, here, print this. I feel like it's not unreasonable, and we can argue over this. Um, if I get a Dunlap, and I'm the person entrusted in my community with a Dunlap, I'm not so sure that I'm just like, here you go, print this. I'm like, ooh, I'm keeping this tight to, like, I'm not letting anybody get this. I don't think, given the length of these things, I don't think it's out of the question that somebody would transcribe it by hand. And similar to what Dunlap worked from with Jefferson, that somebody got a handwritten, transcribed version, typeset this and print this for me. I, so I don't know that we're ever going to get an answer. Maybe there's some kind of notation somewhere, but I, I'm not convinced that everybody got the one column Dunlap as the starting point. Thank you. Yes? It's a bit of a history question, but... Uh... Oh, that's probably for someone else in the room then. Answered by that one Dunlop that you said was that he printed later, 
Yeah. How much later did you catch that? Oh, within days. It's like the thinking is within like a week. Well, in the one that he printed the night of July 4th, yeah. there are gaps larger than they should be. Yes. Certain letters. Yes. And historians, many think that that shows that he was working off of Jefferson's clean copy, which had diacritics on it, which right. the compositors saw as quotation marks. And the thing that was found a few decades ago that was believed to be the page proof, it was part of the broadside and it had quotation marks in those places. And that whoever proofed it, Jefferson, whoever, we don't know, said, no, 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 those were Jefferson's diacritics. Take those out. And because they were in such a rush, right. they didn't have time to reset the, the type and close those gaps. Right. So I was wondering if that later Dunlop actually had those gaps closed. But I don't know whether you can tell from um, it kind of does, but the, the rhythm of how the type is set, I think given the font shift is, so if we look at the left, this is the original done left. We have one, two, three, four, five, six lines that are inset from the drop. One, two, three, four on the other one. So like the spacing of things shifts pretty significantly. Like from six to four, that in terms of typesetting, that's a pretty that's a pretty big difference because that's going to affect everything that follows after that. So I haven't gotten into looking at the details of like the nuanced difference between the two, um, but I think it's a fair point and it's something that a lot of people are in, in the written articles and pieces that are already out. That tends to be something that comes up is like, how close is the fidelity to Jefferson's handwritten draft versus how much was being interpreted on press? And I don't know. Because there are multiple Jefferson drafts, too. And so then people argue over, well, it was this draft. And he was it's like, OK. But maybe we can like it, go back and somehow conjure spirits in the Continental Restaurant and <laughs> figure out how it worked. Yeah. I, I haven't come across anything that's specific to the declaration. They talk about some other projects they worked on, but I've not found anything yet that is specific to the printing of the declaration. My guess is most of these were rushed. I mean, we know that Dunlap's was rushed because they went from the State House, the Independence Hall in today's world, over to Dunlap, which was like a two block walk. And they, they watched him get this all going. So, I mean, they were, right there, and like in today's world, it'd be called a press check. Um, so they were there proofing. No, not so, at least not that I'm aware of. There may be something. Yeah, so I think one of the interesting things, like I have some copies of Dunlap's um, Daily Advertiser print uh, newspaper that he did, and I'm amazed, because it's only four pages. They're like this big, and but I show students and my students are always like, what? Because I'm like, they sell this type, printed it, and then took all that apart, redistributed it in the cases, and the next day they did it all again. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, so when you're typing, that's super easy. And they're like, why would they do that? I'm like, because it was faster than writing. <laughs> like, that's why. Like, at the time, that would have been fast. Um, there may be, the, uh, I'm missing the, there's a guy, shoot, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. He did like a printing history of colonial America, thick book. I just recently got a copy of it. So uh, there's some back and forth. He has some correspondence in that book, but I, I'm not sure that there's anything that's. Yeah, the weird thing, so I, I would have expected there'd be a lot about Dunlap because of how significant his work had been, there's really very little about Dunlap. It's, it's hard to find anything about him. Now, Mary Catherine Goddard, I think more recently, in the past 10 to 20 years, female printer in colonial period, there's been a lot more interest in trying to make some sense of that. Um, so there's a lot about her. And 
Like, there's even kids' books about Mary Catherine Goddard. And so, like, Dunlap, there's virtually nothing. I mean, there's like a paragraph or two and then another. Dunlap, when the British occupied Philadelphia, he actually moved his shop to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. That was another thing that got me interested. I'm trying to identify where on Queen Street, which restaurant <laughs> that's there now was where he printed. Um, but he was in Lancaster. There are bylines for Lancaster. There are also um, credit lines for Charlottesville. He had a shop in Charlottesville for it's at least some period of time. Somewhere on the other side of that wall, there's something that has the Charlottesville credit line. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, yep. Yeah. Okay. I have another question for you. Yeah. Go to the last slide. The very, the very, yeah, yeah. Hold on. Over here, all the way down. Yeah, this one. Yeah, not the same slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the, um, the, the third one on the bottom, that's Goddard, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, from a sort of macro level, yeah. it looks exactly the same as the one on the far left on the bottom. Is that true on a micro yeah. level that you zoom in? Is it, is it really the same layout? Because it, it looks almost, not entirely identical, but it looks very, very. Um, when you look at the spacing, you know, if you look at where right. the blank spaces are and the shape of the blank spaces, it looks like the lines match up really well. Not perfectly, but right. pretty well. It's probably pretty similar. I haven't looked at that specifically, but I would imagine that most of the printers had a similar size press that they were using. So that'll determine the size of the sheet, like anybody who's even yeah. printing today, right? Yeah, yeah max size. Right. right. So which, the, which one is that? The left, that's um, a Russell. Hold on. No, that's the foul from Exeter, New Hampshire. The one on the left. On the left. This oh. first one? Oh, um, I went out of frame, didn't I? The one on the bottom left. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, in other words, there's no obvious connection between them. But the no, the and actually, so no. So, Goddard wasn't working from any of the other broadsides. She was working from the um, engrossed copy that Matlack had lettered. So she had that, and that's how she knows the, the names of the signers. So she's able to see that. And she's, she was the first person, she was the first printer to see that. Congress had it with, they would hold it close as they were moving about. So that, like the, the engrossed copy is the, the one that actually matters. Not that these don't matter, but the engrossed copy with the signatures, that's the binding document with the signatures. The other ones are great and they're significant historically, but the, the engrossed copy is the one that was the legally binding document. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. How, yeah. how long would it take experienced typesetters to type? The type? And second, uh, about the ink, the can scraping, would that do? Oh, yeah. Would that incorporate, were, were the gunpowder? There may be, I'm not sure exactly what we scraped out of the cannon barrel, a bunch of metal. It was mostly, it felt like mostly rust. I have some of it remaining at my studio. Um, no, 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 no. That was just us trying to get it connected to the revolutionary period. Um, so yeah, that was just us trying to make sense of how close can we get to 1776. Um, what was your first question? Oh, how long? Um, so to print 200 copies, hour to two hours probably at most to print, to typeset, experienced typesetter, I can't imagine it would take more than an hour to do that. I mean, maybe faster depending on, I mean, so in uh, the other slide, hold on, let me see if I can find it. I don't know that these have it, a good example of this. If I go back to the beginning, do you know how many M's of type are in the Dunlop broadside? I do not. Let me see these. These aren't good examples. So there are like no, there are notches on current type that you don't. Once you know the case layout, you you just need to like grab a piece. You flip it around your fingers and you feel for like there's a little notch. The notch goes down and away. Typically when you're putting in a composing stick. So typesetters. Compositors would be super fast. Like they just grab, flip, like they, I mean, they're setting type very quickly. So 
I, on the other hand, <laughs> let me see where this is. So to do, and this, so this is 1,000 characters, which was challenging for me. This took me like seven hours. This probably would have taken, <laughs> I had another image of me at my house. I had to take the case of type to my house because I was so sick of being at my print shop. Uh, my wife was like, why are you here when what is all this stuff? I'm like, I'm trying to set this type. I thought it would take me like two hours and I'm like six hours in. Um, what took me seven hours would have taken somebody probably like 20 minutes. It's super fast. Which, it's just, we don't do it. It's also like when you're working a platen press, like the, the old school kind, those things are moving, like they are really moving. Ours goes like this, and even that feels super fast. <laughs> like we have it motorized now, and I'm like, every time I'm reaching, I'm like, oh, that's gonna get me. Um, <laughs> but I've watched people do it, and they're treadle pressing. I mean, they're like pumping, and this thing's like, knocking pr prints out, and I'm like, what? How on earth? But if that was your job and you did it all the time, you're probably pretty, pretty good at it. Yeah. Yeah. Were you able to print the Declaration of Independence in one evening? Have you yeah, because I use photopolymer plate. I didn't typeset it. <laughs> <laughs> I got a photopolymer plate on a boxcar base, and that was good. So, <laughs> yes. Um, I was trying to match the type, and what I, I hadn't done as much research at, the, at that time, and so I was really troubled trying to figure out, like I have a whole bunch of versions of Caslon on my computer. I could not match some of the letters. I was like, what is going on? I was so frustrated trying to get the high-res scan from Library of Congress and superimpose and understand like where the shifts and, the, and I hadn't looked at it closely enough to know. It was probably just an exercise of futility for me to just try doing it. I ended up drawing, drawing in quotes with vectors in Illustrator, some of the letter forms because I couldn't find anything that was even close with fonts. So it was a mix of Illustrator vectors, um, Caslon 540, Caslon Old Face, probably three or four different Caslon fonts, and then photopolymer. It went super smooth. <laughs> yeah, it's like terrible for me to say that after these people have done such, such, such an incredible job with all this stuff, and I'm like photopolymer. Like, there's this, and then I have like a plastic thing. But that's part of what has helped letterpress stay in the mix in today's digital driven world of design that you can take a PDF file and get to a printing press. I mean, there's, I'm torn because I have a font design at Hamilton that was cut by an, a 19th century pantograph machine. And like, so I, I'm like, ooh, that's like legit. Like that's digital from my computer, but then we get templates and we're cutting by hand and listening to the router blades spin to casting, there are people that still cast metal type. So like I'm torn and I'm like, you know, it's what we have now. So I, I don't wanna be dismissive of it because it has helped a lot of these presses come back to life that would have been like just gone, that somebody would have scrapped it because there was no use for it. So there is a new generation that has found letterpress because of being able to take a PDF and get the photopolymer, get on press. So yeah, but yeah, it's like, very sheepishly, sheepishly say, I thought of polymer. <laughs> Our conversation will continue in the multi-purpose room at a reception in Craig Welch's honor. But before that breaking news, there's a new copy of the Declaration of <laughs> <laughs> that we're giving to Craig. Oh, right on. Thank you so much. Thank you.